Hey, 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 welcome to chapter 32. OG, it's OB. As a disclosure, this presentation is going to show graphic images and all the images and language are intended for mature audiences. So first thing we're going to discuss about with OB is the vagina. So the vagina is part of the birth canal. That is its intended function. Um, so the ovaries and the fallopian tubes, the ovaries are responsible for producing that ova, where the fallopian tubes are the, uh, is where the fertilization occurs. So when the sperm reaches in, that's where the fertilization occurs. Um, ecotopic pregnancies occur outside of the fallopian tubes, so that ova gets fertilized in some place where it's not supposed to. So the uterus is the hollow organ located right midline in the woman's lower abdomen. This is where the fertilized egg is supposed to implant and develop into a fetus. So as that little peanut's growing inside the woman's body, it's growing in the uterus. So the uterus stretches and grows as that fetus gets bigger. So as you see the typical pregnant female has that belly is getting bigger from the baby growing that uterus too is stretching and growing to be able to hold and expand as that fetus grows the cervix is uh, basically is a barrier between the uterus and the vagina so you may have if you are familiar with anything with any kind of delivery of heard terms when they talk about a female being dilated they're referring to that cervix so it's a muscular ring separating the uterus and the vagina, which is basically keeping the baby in the uterus. So as a woman starts to dilate, that muscular ring starts to dilate. So as that ring gets bigger and bigger and bigger, when the fully dilated means that the birth canal is completely open, there's no longer a barrier allowing that fetus to go from the uterus into the birth canal. So in some images here, so here is the vagina, the opening of the birth canal. And this main part here is the uterus. This is where the baby is supposed to be forming. Uh, out here, these refer to the fallopian tubes. And on the sides is the egg cells. So this is where the eggs will be released. Where fertilization should be occurring in through here in the fallopian tubes. And then that embryo growing inside the uterus. So with the reproductive cycle of the female, it's all based off of hormones. So menstruation is um, part of the hormonal process. So menstruation occurs by the hormone of estrogen and progesterone. So the ovaries are released, that uterus wall thickens, the fallopian tubes are passing that egg down in through the uterine walls and it's expelling that stuff. So just a natural process is the body cycles, the female's body cycles through eggs, passing them and that is the reason for the menstruation cycle and the bleeding. So fertilization, a sperm reaches the ovum, the ovum becomes that embryo, the embryo implants into the uterus where it's supposed to be and that's where the fetal stage begins is when that embryo reaches into the uterus so i'll talk about some physiological changes during pregnancy so i'd say everybody's pretty familiar that pregnancy during the last nine months that's broken up into three three month trimesters the placenta is the uh, the tissue that's connected uh, to the baby that uh, provides all the oxygen and the nutrients to the baby. So that placenta is that exchange area between the mother and the fetus. And that umbilical cord is attached to that placenta and that's the life cord into the fetus. So the umbilical cord is responsible for circulating the blood. Um, everything attached to the umbilical cord so is whatever's going into the mother system passes that through that umbilical cord to the baby and within 
Uh, all that is within the amniotic sac. So amniotic sac is a fluid that allows the fetus to kind of float, cushions the fetus, and maintains a good fetal body temperature continually. So it's, it's basically a little fetus hammock within that body is that amniotic sac. So when they hear the phrases of their fluid broke or their waters broke, that's that amniotic sac breaking and that fluid being discharging. So as you can see here in the illustration, you have the birth canal down here and generally your um, placenta, it should be up here towards the top. Now there are some conditions that will cause this to be in different places. So the baby's within the amniotic sac, you see the umbilical cord running from that placenta going into the belly button of the fetus. Now the little baby growing inside the female's body is not the only change occurring to her body. There's a lot of changes to the cardiovascular, respiratory, and the GI system. So cardiovascularly, there's a pretty big increase in blood volume because the body just senses that there's another human being growing inside there and that human being needs blood too. So the body will stimulate hormones, increase more blood volume in that patient. So that has a change to the whole cardiac output, the heart rate, so a pregnant patient, her heart rate's going to be up a little bit, having a higher cardiac output, so cardiac monitoring is very big on all pregnant patients. With the respiratory system, there's an increase in oxygen demand and consumption because normally we're breathing, trying to provide for two lungs, but then the female patient who's pregnant is going to be breathing, trying to provide oxygenation for four lungs, two bodies. So she's got a little bit more work to do. The GI system, uh, slow digestion. So a lot of those patients that have acid reflux really bad, they'll be nauseous and vomiting. And that's all part of the process. Generally, most of that stuff subsides after the first trimester. With the hormone side, the ligaments become a little more elastic. Thus, the patients are going to be a little bit more susceptible to being injured, such as in vehicle accidents, traumatic injuries, just sprains, pains, things like that. They're going to, of course, have more weight, so that's going to be affecting their posture. They'll have back pains, pelvic pains, uh, may have some balance issues. So if you've ever seen anybody who's pretty far along in their pregnancy, they kind of waddle a little bit just from a variety of things shifting and moving and uh, kind of being in places it's not normally supposed to be. The other stuff, anything pre-existing medical condition, you know, a lot of doctors and stuff will advise patients that they may not be healthy enough to go for pregnancy just from those underlying health conditions. No matter what the patient tells you, all the weight they put on is not fat. So the placenta, the infant, the amniotic fluid, everything that's making up that baby being made can weigh on average anywhere from 20 to 24 pounds. If you think the average weight of a child, about eight pounds, so all the other fluid and everything goes into it, it's going to add a lot of weight. So where that placenta everything develops in the uterus, since it's midline, that's generally right over top of the inferior vena cava. So when that patient's laying on their spine in the supine position, all that weight can compress on that inferior vena cava. And since the job of that inferior vena cava is to return blood to the heart, it's going to reduce the cardiac output because there's not going to be much blood getting to the heart. Therein, the heart's not going to be able to pump out much blood, so that can cause dizziness, patient become lethargic, their blood pressure to drop, a variety of things just make them feel like that they're going to pass out. And that's due just to the placenta and the infant. Everything in there being pressed on that inferior vena cava reducing the blood flow to the heart, they're reducing blood flow out of the heart. So the patients, you need to pad up the right butt cheek a little bit and have them lay on their left side a little bit. So take a towel, blanket, pillow, anything, and just pad up that right butt cheek and kind of let them lay on their left side. With the patient assessment of the woman in labor, 
you need to be asking some basic questions. So outside of your normal sample OPQRST things. So knowing their name, their age, the expected due date, or how far along they are. So if their expected due date's in two weeks, or they tell you they're 38 weeks along, you need to know all that stuff. It's very important. Because if they say, oh, my due date's tomorrow, I think I'm in labor, very good chance it probably could be in labor. But if they say, my due date's not for another seven months, I think I'm in labor, smaller chances of that. So one question I ask, is this your first pregnancy? We're gonna assess the Gravita Para score. So say if a patient has been pregnant three times, third pregnancy being the current one, and they've had two deliveries. So that means that they've had successful deliveries on every pregnancy so far. So the way to remember this is when you give the score of a G, P, whatever the numbers may be, G means you got it. You got knocked up. P means that you were a parent. So that means you had a successful delivery. And all those are knowing a ses successful delivery. So if you were to say a patient is a G5P1, that means they've had some miscarriages, abortion, or something. And that all increases the risk, makes them a um, high-risk delivery patient. Then asking, has a patient seen a doctor? Are they taking any prenatal vitamins, any kind of medicines with that? If they are seeing a doctor, see if there have been any issues. Again, if a patient tells you they haven't seen a doctor, for whatever reason, big indication that something could potentially be wrong. That's a sense that you can have paranoia because that's why the patients go to the doctors regularly to make sure that the fetus is developing how it should the placenta is in the place that it should, everything else is going to plan. Because for all you know, that baby could be in there in the wrong direction. They could be set up to be coming out feet first, which could cause you some major, major issues. And then your OP crusty T kind of going to the play of when do the labor pains start, how regularly are they, and things along that line. Then asking if the patient, if they have any sensation to push or to move their bowels. If a patient says that they feel like they have to poop really bad, that's a lot of pressure being exerted down there and the patient will feel like they have to poop. And then ultimately, examine. If they feel like they have the urge to push or you really think they're in labor, you need to look to see if they are. So examine the vagina to see if you see any crowning or any signs of imminent delivery. Feeling for uterine contractions. That means put your hand on their belly if they tell you they're having a contraction feel, as you put your hand on their belly, kind of poke it a little bit. Not too hard, but if that abdomen is as hard as a bowling ball, extremely hard, that's a true contraction. So with real contractions, that belly gets insanely hard. And always, with every patient, taking their vital signs, keeping an eye on them. So here is an image of crowning. So crowning, the baby's head is starting out the vagina. So that is an imminent sign of delivery. That baby is almost on its way completely out. So if you see that, you don't be driving up a road in the ambulance. This is when you stop and do delivery or if in the house, you do delivery when you see this. Some findings might indicate that you may have to perform resuscitation on this baby once they're born. These are always big indicators, warning signs that you may end up having your hands full. If the patient has a history of pregnancy problems, such as miscarriages, stillborn deliveries, or premature deliveries, or any kind of um, ectopic pregnancies, or they've had breech deliveries before where their last kid came out feet first, um, if they've had no prenatal care, so if they don't even know how many kids are inside of them because they haven't seen a doctor, that's a bad indicator labor induced by anything other than natural the natural causes such as if they overdosed on cocaine and now they're in labor or they've been involved in traumatic injury and now they're in labor also any kind of meconium staining if that water breaks meconium will be a yellowish greenish color so if they have some kind of really nasty discharge stuff 
coming out of the birth canal, that means with the meconium that the baby has probably pooped inside the body. So yes, the baby can poop once they're in the inside. So while they're in that amniotic sac, there's no place for that poop to go. So the baby could end up aspirating their own bowels. So now we're going to talk about the actual labor and delivery of that pregnant patient. So the first stage of labor begins when the patient begins to feel regular contractions and that cervix is completely dilated. So that cervix being that muscular ring that's holding that baby back from entering that birth canal, well the door to that barrier is now open. It's fully dilated, nothing to hold them back, so it's easy for that baby to come out of the uterus into the birth canal which is at the second stage. So once that baby into that birth canal and is born, that's the whole second stage. So second stage going from once the baby into that birth canal, into the birth canal, out of the mom is the whole second stage. So that's really the biggest part of it, the so second stage. Then the third stage when labor ends is after that after birth is delivered. So the placenta, the remaining part of the umbilical cord, all that will be delivered from the uterus and then labor is fully over. Within that first stage, a patient may feel Braxton Hicks contractions, which is false labor. They're irregular, they're not really consistent, they're not sustained, and those aren't indicators of a pending delivery. Generally with Braxton Hicks contractions, that patient won't have that severely and very 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 rigid abdomen they're not going to have that bowling ball for a belly they'll feel contractions their abdomen will get a little bit tighter but it won't be very very hard then there is um, lightning is the fetus's movement from high in the abdomen down towards the birth canal so you, you may hear a lot of patients saying the baby's dropping and they may have be able to tell from their doctor or just from all the regular selfies in the mirror that they've seen that that belly has been up high and now everything's sitting a little bit low where that whole fetus is actually starting on its journey towards the uterus and is shifted down just a little bit more. So those contractions of the uterus is what's producing those normal labor pains. So that uterus will be contracting, helping push that fetus down into the birth canal. It's extremely painful on the patients. They will know. Especially if they've had labor before, they know what true contractions are going to feel like. So characteristics of those labor pains. Knowing the contraction time or duration, the interval and the frequency. So assessing how long they lasted and how far apart they are. So when they're less than 30 seconds to a minute and within a couple minutes apart, delivery is imminent. So if they're having legitimate contractions, their abdomen's staying hard for at least 30 seconds and they're just a couple minutes apart. So every couple minutes they're having those really hard abdomens, they're in true delivery. And breaking of the amniotic sac, so if Fluid coming out is not always an indicator that delivery is imminent. There are several patients to where the doctors have had to intentionally go and rupture the sac because the, the labor is so far along. So just because a woman's water has broke does not mean that baby's about to come out at any moment. Generally, it is a precursor to labor beginning, but not always 100%. So if you see that fluid and it has a meconium staining, that greenish and yellow, there's probably going to, that fetus is going to be in distress because they could potentially have aspirated that meconium. In that first stage of labor, whenever the contractions and everything begin, as you'll see here in this picture, is typically is how the baby should be positioned in the uterus. So in that first stage of labor, that uterus starts to contract and the head will start to enter the birth canal into that second stage. So in this first stage, that uterus is contracting. The baby is essentially kind of upside down. That uterus will contract, causing that abdomen to be extremely rigid. 
and then second phase when that baby begins to enter into the birth canal. So during that second stage is when you have a full dilation of that cervix. The contractions are becoming increasingly frequent, the pain's getting worse, and that mother feels the urge to push or move their bowels. Yes, the mother in labor will feel like she has to poop. So if they feel the need to, if they say they have the need to push or they have to poop, that's a very good sign that labor is imminent. So at this point, that's when you will have to decide whether you can safely transport the patient or if it's a stay and play situation when you're going to have to deliver the baby wherever you may be because you don't want to be driving up the road at Mach 3 when that greasy cheesy baby comes out and then it's almost like a game of hot potato and you're trying to hold on to that slimy baby while you're beep bopping all around in the ambulance. So you see here in that second stage this is when you will be assisting the mother in delivering of the baby. As you see in this picture here you have this hand Position carefully down here and notice that it is a gloved hand because there's going to be a lot of fluids and it's going to be messy. So what this hand here is doing is protect that baby's head as it comes out. Now as I said before, the mother will feel the need to push or feel like she has to poop. Sometimes they do poop. So here what you need to do is create a pad for the mother's butt to be up on. So this creates a little bit of a drop zone down here because if they poop the poop can go and wiggle out down here away from the baby being delivered out whereas if you have the butt and the baby's head coming down the same plane they can kind of get cross contaminated so the job of this hand here is to be covering up the bum of the mum so when that head comes out it's not going to get a big brown streak down the front of it and you'll gently support the head as the baby works its way out So after the baby's birth, those contractions are still going to be occurring. If the mother is still hard and rigid, doesn't mean that, uh-oh, maybe there is a second baby she didn't know about, which I guess could happen, but with the mother having prenatal care, if she knows there's only one baby, those contractions are going to be delivering the placenta. Generally, they can come out pretty quick. Sometimes it's a little bit longer. You know, the, the books and statistics show on average 10 to 20 minutes but some have taken upwards of hours so that will be when delivery is completely over is when that placenta is delivered in this picture here is the final stage of labor the third stage when that placenta is delivered so as you'll see here this is in that uh, placenta is where the baby was living in the uterus. This was the fuel source and the feeding source for that baby. You can see in the picture the clamps for that umbilical cord. Now after they deliver this placenta, the mother still may be bleeding some. Um, you just don't want to be packing anything. You don't pack it like it's a major trauma wound, but you'll still want to cover it up with some kind of sterile dressing, like a multi-trauma dressing, abdominal pad, or something. If they are bleeding, one thing that can aid in the process of stopping the bleeding is you rub on the fondus. So that is basically just at the top of the pubic bone. If you rub in that area gently, that will help stimulate the hormones that need to be produced. That will aid in all the internal stuff going on to help stop or slow that bleeding. So now we're going to discuss how you deliver or assist the mother in delivering the baby. So your job as an EMT is going to basically do good assessment, knowing whether it's safe to deliver on scene or if you need to go and transport immediately or if you just have time to transport to the OB labor and delivery department for the hospital staff to deliver this baby. So always the scene safety, wear PPE. This, the illustrations don't do it justice. It can be a very messy scene. So wear PPE, gowns, long gloves, eye protection. Um, you're going to get the mother position comfortably, whether that's on a bed, the floor, or on your ambulance stretcher. 
remove all of the um, clothing that could be obstructing the delivery of that baby, such as the pants, shirts, anything that's in the way, because if you believe labor is imminent, you're going to have to inspect. So delivering a female who you believe might go into labor soon, it's a good idea just to go ahead and remove their pants just in case labor would begin suddenly and you're not trying to remove the pants off a woman in the middle of contractions. It can be very difficult. So get the patient positioned comfortably, get out your OB kit, and make the environment as warm as you can. So in the back of the ambulance, turn on the heat, uh, get everything nice and clean and prepared so wherever the delivery area is, you'll need to lay out sterile sheeting and everything that's in that OB kit to be prepared to deliver the baby. As I said, an essential part is derobing of the mother, so you don't want anything in the way that could slow down or hinder your uh, delivery ability. So if you, you feel that the mother is going to be delivering soon, you need to derobe her. Now you don't necessarily have to get the patient completely derobed as in this picture, but you at least need to get the lower garments off, underwear, pants, everything to do an inspection. So. If you even believe that it could be in labor anytime soon, maybe even before you get in position on the cot, get their pants off, maintain their integrity, cover them up with a sheet or something. Go ahead and get those off so you can do an inspection, make sure there's no crowning, and just makes you more easily and readily prepared to deliver that baby if need be. So have the mother position on her back, have sterile dressings over the legs using sheets, uh, normal dressings, whatever you may need to be put in over those legs because when this baby comes out you want the baby to be coming in a clean environment which in the back of the ambulance isn't necessarily the cleanest place. So get the mother cleaned nice and sterile which is a reason why some people prefer to have the patient completely naked so in case they do have contaminants on their clothes or anything because you're in a hospital setting they're in a gown that's clean and sterile. The whole room's cleaned and sterile and bleached top to bottom. And that's not necessarily the case in the back of an ambulance. Then you want to get the OB kit ready. So I have all this tricks. The last thing you need to be doing is trying to hold a baby's head with one hand and grab and open an OB bag with the other hand in your teeth. So get this stuff out, get it ready, get everything prepared for you to be doing a delivery. Remember, you're not going to be doing this delivery going down the road. So if going down the road, delivery becomes imminent, you need to stop. So getting that kit ready. So in here comes with an array of things. You've got the little suctioning bulb. You've got the little bonnet. You've got your umbilical cord clamps, tape, uh, a plastic bag. So you'll put the placenta in that and numerous other just sterile dressings to be put in, in the areas to keep everything nice and clean. So now it's time to deliver the baby. So you got the mother positioned so you can keep a good eye on everything and be prepared for that mother to probably be in a lot of discomfort, yelling, screaming. So the big part of this is going to be emotional support, keeping the mother relaxed trying to keep them calm and reassured as possible because I don't think any mother's birthing plan involved you. Remember that. You were not part of this mom's plan. Over the past, hopefully, nine months, you were no part of this plan, so there's a big curveball in her day. So provide a lot of emotional support to help her along the way. Then you're going to need to communicate thoroughly. So tell them, you know, when there's contractions, if they feel the need to push, to go ahead that you're ready you know there's no calling timeouts in this mother nature is not gonna intervene with your game plan she has her own agenda so going with the normal delivery try to keep somebody else at the mother's head so while you're sitting still and remember back to that initial stuff of additional resources needed if you're gonna deliver a baby call for help have wherever you may be have ambulances come to you just to go ahead and deliver at the house, in the back of the ambulance, whether you're parked on the edge of the interstate or whatever. Some at the mother's head, that person's job is going to be probably giving some oxygen, making eye contact, keeping them calm and reassured. Then another person with gloved hands down in the strike zone, getting ready to get that baby out. 
So as the baby starts to come out, put one hand on it just as it bulges through to prevent any kind of sudden uncontrolled expulsion. There are times when babies just want to come out really fast. You don't necessarily want the baby just to come flowing out of there like a guy out of a man cannon. You need to be holding that baby stable so it doesn't explosively come out because that could do a lot of damage to the baby and a lot of damage to the mother. Now, you don't need to go and make a stiff arm on it like you're doing the Heisman pose, but just go ahead and keep support of that baby's head. Once that head starts to present, if you see the head is still in the bag of waters and the amniotic sac is not broken, you need to take your fingers and puncture that membrane. It doesn't take much, so don't pull out a knife and poke at it like you're popping a water balloon. Just take your fingers, pinch that amniotic sac to drain off the waters to assist in the delivery. So as the head comes out, make sure that umbilical cord is not wrapped around the baby's neck. Then you're going to take your little suctioner and you're going to suction out the baby's mouth and then the nose because once that baby's chest enters the air the baby's going to want to take a breath through its mouth first so suction the mouth then the nose then as the baby's head comes out the baby's going to start to turn and one shoulder is going to kind of come through to time so as one shoulder drops down be supporting the head as the shoulder comes out support that shoulder and then the baby will kind of be coming down, hold it, because once that other shoulder comes through, that's the widest part of the body. So as soon as that shoulder comes through, the baby's coming out. So holding that head, assessing the airway, and then keep track of that time of birth. So the illustrations of the delivery. Holding your hand over the poop chute, so when that bait, the mother might take a poop, you don't want the baby getting down in the fecal matter and then have a, the face be in the poop when it goes to take that breath and then aspirate the mother's fecal matter. So holding that head gently, keeping a gloved hand over the poop chute, and be aiding that baby on the way out. So as the head comes out, support the head gently and just be letting the process take its effect. You're not trying to pull on it, you're only there for support. Then suction out the mouth and then the nose and support those shoulders because once the shoulders are out, the baby's coming out. Then gracefully hold the baby and support the whole baby and lay him down at the same level as the mother's birth canal. So now you've got a baby. So now you need to be taking care of that and the mother because now you have two patients. So as soon as they're born, you need to begin your assessment. So you're going to be checking that pediatric assessment trial of their appearance, their worker breathing, and their skin tone, checking their heart rate. Are they crying? Is there movement? Checking out skin color. So all that is part of the APGAR scale. Now the APGAR scale isn't for resuscitation efforts, but that's based on their initial appearance, pulse, grimace, activity, and respiratory effort. So as you can see in this little diagram here of the APGAR scale, twos in everything is the best. You want the baby being pink. You want a heart rate over 100. You want the baby crying. You want them moving and you want them to be cr crying strongly. If a baby is crying, that means they have an open and patent airway. Okay, so then anything less than that, you'll kind of see here as it gets down in on the collar scale. Zeros around everything means that the baby is nearly clinically, if not completely, dead. So the baby will have that bluish skin color too. Uh, Apgar and scoring of one here. A lot of times when the babies come out, their extremities may be blue, their hands and their feet, completely normal. But if you start getting these heart rates under 100, um, they just have a slight grimace, they're not crying, they're just kind of groaning or moaning, not doing much, a little limp, lethargic, more worse signs. While you're assessing that neonate, this may cause for a necessity to stimulate the newborn. So if you 
uh, you don't see that strong cry and the strong movements you're gonna have to stimulate them by flicking the feet rubbing them warm them up it's not like in the movies where they showed them bringing a baby out and spanking her butt that is a form of stimulation but not recommended to do because remember in this mother's game plan you weren't part of it so to have a stranger be the first one to spank her baby's butt is probably not going to make mom happy so rubbing stimulate the kid trying to get them picked up and perked up a little bit so you need to keep the baby warm heat retention to high priority because in these babies they were in a nice warm environment and now they're out to all the atmospheric changes so you get that baby dry um, using your sterile sheets blankets towels whatever you got to be drying that baby off getting the cheese and the gunk kind of stuff off of them and then be discarding any wet blankets so it's better in the area where you may set the baby once they're delivered to lay several layers of towels and blankets so as the baby comes out you can set the baby down on one layer of towels wrap them up like a taco rub them down and then you got one dirty towel pick them up discard that lay them on the new layer of clean towels and then keep doing that until you've got the baby dried off and then wrap them up in that nice clean towel that you have um, and a lot of those OB kits there is a swaddler or a space blanket it's like a silver sheet thing those are good to keep the baby wrapped up when and keep them warm and cover that head put those little bonnets on there if you don't have a bonnet wrap something up over the baby's head with another towel or something keep them a little cocoon looking thing because the baby will lose most of their heat through their head and then encouraging so once you've got the baby stimulated dried everything's okay with the baby then it comes time to cut that umbilical cord um, if a cord's wrapped around that baby's neck and can't be slipped over the head you may uh, have to go ahead and cut that cord early if being attached impedes resuscitation effort if you need to get that baby moved cut an umbilical cord if that umbilical cord is still being attached it would interfere with the urgent need for transport of mother or baby so if you got to get them separated it or if your protocol just requires it so the steps of cutting umbilical cord now this is when the baby's wrapped up nice and warm all is well use those sterile clamps and clamp about 10 inches from the baby and another clamp seven inches from the baby so seven inches from the baby put a clamp a couple more inches put another clamp then once you've got those clamps on and be sure that the clamps are enough because where you're going to cut there should not be a pulse so sometimes those umbilical cords are very big and those little plastic clips may not be enough and you may have to get the clamps out of an airway management bag or open up another OB kit and get the clamps out of there too so you can put two clamps at seven inches and two clamps at ten inches but you need to be sure there's no pulse on that cord before you cut it so cutting that with the scissors or the scalpel that comes in the OB kit then once you've done that and the baby's wrapped up put the baby on the mother's abdomen or chest after the birth process and a lot of studies show putting that baby skin to skin on the mother helps stimulate a lot of hormone releases so if you do that to keep them both wrapped up nice and warm because most of the deliveries I've ever seen they put the naked baby right on the mother's chest you see here in this picture seven inches from the baby and another three inches if all doesn't go according to plan and you do need to resuscitate that newborn you need to provide warmth and assess that baby's airway so getting them warm stimulating them flicking on the feet rubbing on their back aggressively trying to get them warm then assess their airway and their breathing so evaluate those respirations the heart rate and muscle tone so if the baby has shallow slow gasping or no breathing whatsoever provide positive pressure ventilation of about 40 to 60 per minute when that new baby is born they're going to be breathing very fast so you need to breathe fast for them so almost a breath every second 
then assessing that heart rate. So the A, B, C's, or A's and the B's are okay, check the C's. If the heart rate is less than 100, you need to provide ventilations. If the baby thinks breathing 40 times a minute, the heart rate's low, speed it up, ventilate them at about 60, and try to get that heart rate peaked up. If the heart rate is less than 60, you need to give them chest compressions. So you will perform CPR on a baby even if they have a pulse if it's less than 60. If you're seeing these slow heart rates, that's an imminent sign of near cardiac arrest. So that baby's got a heart rate of 40, is just moments away from crashing. So provide ventilations and compressions. If they do have adequate respirations and a pulse greater than 100, then just keep an eye on that airway, making sure it's good and clear, making sure they didn't aspirate anything. You may have to continue suction a baby to get some of the gunk out of their mouth and their nose. So the neonatal resuscitation out or triangle looks like this. So the first thing you're going to want to do at the top is initial things of drying, warming, positioning, making sure airway is open, suction, and tactile stimulation. So you're going to be rubbing the baby, keeping them warm, just trying to suction out the airway if need be. Then giving them some blow by oxygen. So give blow by oxygen for a little bit, see if that peaks them up. If that doesn't, then you provide bag mask ventilations, giving them positive pressure ventilation. If that's not working, then you do chest compressions. Now, if the baby comes out um, unresponsive, pulseless, apneic, you go straight to compressions. Doing CPR on this baby if nothing else has gone up. So to be doing those compressions, the thumb hand encircling technique and two rescuer CPR, keeping the back elevated with those your fingers and then using the thumbs in the lower half of the breastbone to provide chest compressions while the other, your partner, is providing positive pressure ventilation. Okay, so we've successfully delivered a baby all is well. You got the baby and you got the mother, so now you have two patients you need to be taken care of. The mother may be at risk for some serious bleeding, as I mentioned before. They're open to infection um, and possibly emboli. Just because of the clotting process that's about to happen, they couldn't have gotten pulmonary embolisms. Uh, absolute worst case scenario is developing strokes. I uh, gotta be continued to keep an eye on it to deliver that placenta and controlling in that vaginal bleeding. Rub on that fondus area right above the pubic bone. Be rubbing on that, trying to help stimulate that clotting process and ultimately providing comfort and support of the mother and her new child. So with the afterbirth, um, that placenta is gonna be attached to the remaining part of the umbilical cord you didn't cut, the amniotic sac membranes and the tissues of that uterus. So. Once that's delivered, you know, which could take up to 30 minutes, maybe longer, um, you're going to still have to deliver that part. So once you've done all that, everything is good. Be getting them packaged, ready to go. And with that placenta, once it's delivered, put it in a bag because the physicians are going to assess the blood and everything that's in there. There's a lot of studies and stuff and uh, a lot of labs and values that they will pull out of that placenta. So you see in the picture here of rubbing that fondus to help control the bleeding. So rubbing on that fondus right above the pubic bone will help massage that uterus to control any vaginal bleeding. 